Great. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, we're excited to be here. Um, my name is Jason Nomberg. Um, I'm a second year PhD student in the program in virology here at Harvard. Um, you know, in my lab, I kind of study uh, viruses that cause cancer. Hey, everyone. Again, thanks for coming out. Um, I'm Austin Manny. I'm also a second year PhD student in the Harvard Virology program, and I study viruses that infect parasites that infect people. Hi everyone, welcome to Science in the News. My name is Marta. I'm also second year in the virology program at Harvard. I study vaccine immunology, and so I hope you really enjoy this presentation. Great, so today we're going to be talking about um, the past, the present, and the future of viral outbreaks. So Bill Gates once said, if anything kills over 10 million people in the next few decades, it's most likely to be a highly infectious virus rather than a war. Not missiles, but microbes. A hundred years ago, in 1918, the 1918 Spanish flu killed up to 100 million people. Now, uh, on that high end, that may be as, met as much as 5% of the world's population. Ebola, a virus that kills up to 70% of those infected, is continually uh, emerging, quite literally, from the jungle. And in the future, who knows what type of viral outbreaks will emerge? But, the, but there is hope. Let's look at this graph. So in this graph, we have the number of measles cases from 1944 to 2004. Measles is a very contagious and dangerous virus. Something interesting happened around 1964. You can see that the number of measles cases dropped off dramatically. What happened? Well, there was a vaccine introduced. In the span of a few years, measles virus, which used to cause th hundreds of thousands of illnesses, was cut to almost nothing. Let's talk about a much more serious virus, smallpox. You guys don't really hear very much about smallpox nowadays. The reason is, it is one of the only viruses that humanity has ever eradicated. But smallpox used to be around the world, and it used to kill up to 30% of those infected. I'll tell you the story about smallpox a little later. So for our talk, I will discuss some past outbreaks, one of which reaches into the present. Later, Austin will talk about more current outbreaks of Ebola and Zika. And finally, Magda will speak about the mysterious disease X and how we're gonna pr to predict and combat future epidemics. So for my, for my part of the talk, I'm gonna explain what are viruses and what are outbreaks. Next, I'll talk about smallpox, which is the scourge of the human species. And finally, I will talk about an outbreak I'll refer to right now as the mystery. But this mystery outbreak, I mean, it's not a mystery anymore, but uh, it's the story of a pandemic that is current even to this day. So what even are viruses? Well, they're not bacteria, and they're incredibly small. So I'm going to show a little video, and what's going to happen is we're going to start off quite big, you know, about the size of a coffee bean, and we're going to zoom in, and just to give you some scale and appreciation for how small viruses really are. So here's the coffee bean, like I said. We're getting smaller. You know, this is very small. <laughs> There's a skin cell, you know, we're passing a red blood cell, even a chromosome. And finally, we see bacteria. And right, even smaller than bacteria are viruses. Viruses are incredibly small. Not only are viruses small, but viruses are simple. So <laughs> all a virus is, is a genome or a set of instructions surrounded by a protein coat. That's it. So in this cartoon, this is a cartoon of a virus particle. You can see that these kind of coils are a genome. And these, this genome tell, like, is instructions on how to make more genome and more virus particles. So they're incredibly simple. Not only that, viruses depend on a host for replication. Let me explain that a little bit more. So here, we see a virus and a cell. 
So this could be, for example, like the, one of a cell in, like on the back of your throat, for instance. When a virus here infects a cell, it delivers its genome or its set of instructions to the cell. This, these, this genome or set of instructions tricks the cell into making more virus parts and more virus genome. These virus genomes that are created can in turn make even more genome, more parts. And eventually you just have a cell that is just a virus machine, making machine. This, vir this cell is just making virus. And eventually this cell can, will be killed. Viruses will be released. And these viruses can go on to infect more cells. For example, it can spread an infection in the back of your throat. Now, in addition to infecting other cells, viruses can go on to infect people or even animals. I will say that mostly when we were talking about animal transmission of viruses, we're worried about when animals transmit viruses to us. That happens, and Makda and Austin will talk a little bit about that. Now, one thing I want to mention, if, you know, if this viral replication gets out of hand and many people are infected, we can have an outbreak, an epidemic, or even a pandemic. So let's, let's consider a, a small town in the Northeast. Now, if there is an outbreak, let's say there's instance of a disease, many people are getting this virus, and it's more than you would expect. We might call this an outbreak. Let's say this disease gets quite bad. It's spread over even a larger area, and many people are falling ill. This is what we would call an epidemic. And let's say worst case scenario, this virus is infecting people all around the world in multiple geographic locations. This is a pandemic. This has happened many times, and we'll explain a few examples of some recent pandemics. Now, to start my talk, I want to, start, I want to talk about the virus that causes smallpox. Smallpox may have been with us for as many as 30,000 years. I'll tell you its story now. So the 18th century English doctor Edward Jenner once said, smallpox, the most dreadful scourge of the human species. This is a picture of a smallpox virus particle. It looks kind of funny, not gonna lie, but it doesn't cause a very pleasant disease. Nearly 30% of people who were infected with smallpox would end up dying from the disease. This is an image from a 16th century book. It depicts a smallpox victim. The way smallpox progressed is it first, people who were infected with smallpox developed a flu-like illness, but eventually, they would develop this characteristic rash and these pimples all around their body. These pimples would be oozing virus and they were very infectious. At that point, the patients could get better, but they could also get much worse. Remember, we're talking about a 30% death rate. Now, like I said, smallpox may have been with humanity for as much as 30,000 years old, uh, for 30,000 years. This is a 30,000 year old mummy with evidence of a smallpox-like illness in these papules here. So, you know, we have, besides the mummy 30,000 years ago, the first written evidence of smallpox is in written texts in China from the third century. Smallpox is thought to have spread through trade, eventually making its way to Europe in the 11th century, Africa in the 15th, and the Americas in the 16th. Very soon, smallpox was a global disease. This was a true pandemic. I want to talk about Edward Jenner once more. I quoted him a little earlier. In the late 1700s, Edward Jenner made an interesting observation. He noticed that milkmaids who, are handling, uh, who were infected with cowpox from their cows uh, never got smallpox. So cowpox is a very similar virus to smallpox. But when people were infected with cowpox, it gives a very mild illness. So Edward Jenner said, oh, that's very interesting. And he did what scientists do, and he did an experiment. So this is a picture, this is a picture depicting what Edward Jenner did. So he took his gardener's son, and he, you know, that's what you do now, uh, then, but he took his gardener's son, and he infected his gardener's son, James, with cowpox. Then he did something that would obviously be extremely illegal nowadays, and he, he exposed James to smallpox. And James was all right. James did not get infected. James was fine. 
Um, so what this showed is uh, James being infected by cowpox first protected him from smallpox in the future. This is the premise of all vaccines. Vaccines train a person's immune system to recognize and fight uh, the virus next time it sees it. So after Edward Jenner kind of showed that vaccination works, all around the world, people started vaccinating against smallpox. But it wasn't for like maybe a little over 100 years before humanity made significant headway against smallpox. So uh, m thanks in part to vaccination, smallpox was eradicated from America in 1952 and in Europe a year later. In 1959, the World Health Organization began the smallpox eradication campaign. The goal of this campaign was to eradicate smallpox from the face of the earth. Thanks in part to this campaign, smallpox was eradicated in South America in 1971, Asia in 1975, and Africa in 1977. This is a picture of the last known case of someone naturally infected by smallpox. And this was in, I think, uh, 1977 or 1975. Now, in 1979, the World Health Organization declared the world free of smallpox. For the first time in human history, humanity had eliminated a disease from the face of the earth. Nowadays, the only smallpox officially recorded to exist are in secure labs in uh, Atlanta and also another lab in Russia. Note that I said officially recorded to exist. In uh, 2014, some researchers at the NIH found a vial of smallpox just in an unsecured fridge. Um, imagine the scare. Like, that's not a fun discovery. Anyway, th those, vi those vials were as old as 1950s. So I've, <laughs> I've explained smallpox, which has probably been with us for many thousands of years. The next viral outbreak I'm going to talk about probably isn't, hasn't been with humanity for that long. It's thought to have been introduced early in the 1900s, once or twice, from monkeys, actually. So we know what causes this illness now, but at the start, no one knew what was going on. So the mystery began in the, in the early 1980s. Some men per, uh, developed a very rare skin cancer called Kaposi's sarcoma. So 41 men developing a rare skin cancer that is seldom seen except in the very elderly. All of these men were severely immunodeficient. It was later found that, so basically the first cases were these groups of homosexual men. It was later found that whatever virus or illness is causing this uh, disease can affect anyone and everyone. I'll explain more. Now, later on, uh, even more people showed up with kind of weird infections. Uh, this group of patients developed a kind of a very rare fungal infection called pneumocystis. Um, so people were kind of getting like keyed on, like something's wrong. All of these people are getting really rare infections, but no one knew what, what was going on at all. Even more kind of strange groups happened. Now, um, the CDC reported that there was all of these kind of strange infections even in infants. And finally, a year later, the CDC reported that um, whatever this kind of contagion was can actually be transmitted through blood transfusions. The CDC finally gave it a name, Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, or AIDS. But what causes AIDS? People still didn't know. So the, uh, the breakthrough came in 1983, when a group in France, led by Luc and Francois, uh, discovered evidence of a virus in the immune cells from a patient who was about to develop AIDS. This virus went on to be called Human Immunodeficiency Virus, or HIV. Discovering this virus was of critical importance. I want to I remind you that before we knew what caused AIDS, there was absolutely no way we could treat it. No one knew what was causing it, and there's no way we can make medicine to prevent it. In addition, now that we knew what the virus was, we could screen blood to see if the blood had, was infected with HIV. And finally, now that we knew what the virus was, we could study it and we can make medicine. So in green are little HIVs budding out of blue, in blue, 
uh, some cells. So in green are these creepy little HIVs just all over the place and coming out. Um, HIV, even right now, there is no cure and there is no vaccine. It wasn't until 1987 that the first drug against HIV, AZT, was introduced. Before AZT, AIDS patients had nothing. Many of the AIDS patients before AZT would end up dying of opportunistic infections because we didn't have any medicine to help them. But AZT doesn't cure HIV. All it does is sends the virus into hiding. Nowadays, in modern days, patients get a cocktail of many HIV drugs. But the thing is, the virus is always just hiding. Whenever the patients stop taking the drugs, the virus will always come back. We haven't been able to cure HIV. But there is some good news. This is some data from the World Health Organization. In yellow, you can see the number of people newly infected with HIV. This, these numbers are finally decreasing. It is finally going down. In red, you can see the number of deaths due to AIDS. This number is also finally going down. So this shows we are finally making some headway in fighting this disease. I have hope that in the future, we will be able to develop a vaccine. But you can ask me in the intermission why it's so tricky for this virus. So I'd be happy to take any questions. Yes, uh, well, two kind of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, when a cell is infected, mm -hmm. if the virus is so small, all the, the immuno, the, all defenses mm -hmm. go and attack the virus? That, that is one mm -hmm. question. Another question is, there is some medicines that they are the antiviral or something like that. You, you take it and mm -hmm. supposedly the virus or something. Mm -hmm. So how, how they work? Both of them. Oh, sure. When you are infected. <coughs> yeah, so the first question was, um, viruses are so small. How does your immune system like target viruses when they're so small? So there's several ways the immune system can do it. There are special immune cells that recognize virus and produce a specific defense against the virus um, called antibodies that go into your blood. Um, now, another way kind of this happens is infected cells themselves basically stick out flags and say, hey, we're infected with the virus, please help us. And, and the immune system can recognize that and target those cells. And then his second question was, normally there are some antivirals or drugs we can take to help uh, fight a virus infection. And he wanted to know how that worked. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, great. So, Normally, the way an antiviral works is it tries to mess up something that the virus does that humans do not. So some viruses have to do special things that we don't really do, so the drug will just combat the virus without hurting us. Do we still immune uh, children against smallpox? No, actually. So we don't. We don't. So the question was, uh, do we still vaccinate children against smallpox? Smallpox is officially eradicated. There are no, there's no evidence of wild smallpox. So we don't give smallpox immunizations anymore. Has there been any thought of destroying the stockpiles in Russia and in mm -hmm. the US? Yeah, so that's, uh, the question was, have, has there been any thought of destroying the smallpox stockpiles in Russia and the United States? So. Actually, one of the leaders of the smallpox eradication campaign and many others really want those stocks destroyed. Um, but there's kind of another argument, and that goes, you know, what if there's some unforgotten stock of smallpox and there's an outbreak? We need some samples to be able to study so we can make better medicine and so on. So it's actually like a really kind of debate. There's both sides. Yeah. Was it one of the problems with HIV that mm -hmm. was that attacked? the immune cells mm -hmm. that would normally destroy things. And was there something with a CD4 or a CD20 receptor? And are there certain people who are genetically less sensitive because they have different kinds of receptors? And wasn't that being used as some attempt to get a vaccine? <clears throat> so the question was, uh, HIV targets your immune system. And are there certain people, based on certain properties they have, that are more resistant to HIV based on their receptor properties. 
So the, the answer is, to, to a point, yes. So to answer your question, HIV infects CD4 positive T cells. Um, don't, don't worry about that. But so the thing is, some patients have, there's different immune molecules that everyone has. Everyone has different versions of these immune molecules. Some of them are very good at like f helping your cells fight against HIV. And in these people, when they're infected with HIV, uh, you know, HIV can still infect them, but it just takes a long time for HIV to really kill their immune system. The problem is, given enough time, it will happen. Mm, good question. So, so the question was, how is PrEP different than a vaccination for HIV? So a vaccination, the way that would work is to make your immune system like ready to combat the virus. So basically what that, that, what, what that would mean is you vaccinate a person and now this person's immune system can fight the virus whenever it's seen. The thing is, the way PrEP works, uh, so basically for those who don't know, um, PrEP is a way to, for high risk groups, people who may get HIV, they are, it's drugs you can take to help reduce the chance you get HIV. The thing is, PrEP, all it is is simply antiviral drugs, kind of like I mentioned earlier. These drugs don't really affect your immune system that much. All the drugs are doing are directly fighting the virus. It's not training your immune system to do anything. Mm -hmm. I uh, read a year or two ago that a, if an infant was seemingly eradicated of HIV, I, I guess the mother was um, infected. Is there a threshold at which uh, it can no longer be cleared? So you mentioned that there's no cure for HIV. It's just mm -hmm. that as long as you're taking the um, antiviral medicine, it, uh, it goes into hiding. Mm -hmm. is, is there some threshold at, of no return? So it's like a minimal viral count or something? So, so the question was, like, is there at some point, like, if we, if we intervene fast enough, is there a way to stop, like, cure someone from HIV infection? So basically, when they're infected, if we act super fast, we'll, can we cure them? So this has happened once, from my understanding. It was in an older patient who, uh, you know, he happened to get actually a whole, I think it was a, he got like a stem cell transplant. And he actually, you, they actually transplanted in cells from a patient who had these immune molecules that were better at fighting HIV as well. Um, and that's the only time this is, unfortunately, from what I understand, that's the only time that's happened. For the vast majority of people, it just, it's just too difficult to do it. Um, it's very hard to achieve a cure when someone is infected. Hey everyone, I'm Austin again, um, and today I'll be talking about the present of viruses. So um, what viruses did we see today or um, just a few years ago? And so in part one, Jason told you about some of the viral scourges of the earth um, that has plagued humanity before. And then the next part, Mokta will tell you about what scientists are doing today to protect us from viruses tomorrow. Um, but right now I think it's worthwhile to reflect on some of the challenges we have faced most recently um, and uh, by looking at these viral epidemics that we have just gone through, we can um, see what we have learned in the past and what work still needs to be done. Yeah, so um, as we have moved forward in facing these infectious diseases, uh, the public health landscape has shifted significantly. But as uh, with most things, there's good things and there's the downside. So on the positive side, um, you know, in the past few decades, there's been improved urban hygiene, um, which means that most places that people live are getting cleaner and less uh, permissive of viruses. Um, so it makes it harder for them to thrive. The next is better healthcare systems. So people who do, you know, come down with um, viruses can go seek treatment. 
Um, and finally, there's, uh, in the past couple decades especially, there's been a decline in global poverty. So people are, have better access to food, water, shelter, and overall just a higher standard of living. And so with this, it makes them more um, ready to fight any viruses they may encounter. However, uh, you know, moving from this, uh, people these days are living closer together with the exponential rise in the global population of humans. Um, people are being forced into tighter quarters, which makes it way easier for viruses to spread. Um, also, because of that, in the same vein, uh, people are moving into what was previously wild, wild um, life uh, areas. And so I'll talk about this more later, but basically it's just an easy opportunity for viruses to jump from animals into humans. And finally, with thousands of flights crisscrossing the globe every day, um, it's a perfect opportunity for viruses to travel like they never did before. So the first virus I want to talk to you today is Ebola. Um, you may remember seeing this on the news just a few years ago. So there was a huge outbreak in West Africa uh, of Ebola that began in 2013. Um, it spread into a full-blown epidemic and was continued pretty much unhalted until 2016. Here in this image, you see a public health worker in Guinea um, gowning up to go help patients. Um, and this 2013 to 2016 Ebola crisis was the most widespread epidemic of this virus in human history. So by the end of the Ebola epidemic, uh, 11,300 and 25 people ultimately died because of the disease. Um, the vast majority of these were in West Africa. However, there were isolated cases in other parts of the world, including here in the US. So one doctor, Craig Spencer, joined Doctors Without Borders and flew overseas into Africa to face the virus on the front lines. Uh, he returned home several months later to New York City on a cold uh, October uh, day, um, a Friday. Six days later, he'd wake up with a fever, the chills, go to the hospital, and find out that he was infected with Ebola. This initi initiated a media frenzy, as portrayed here in the New York Post, um, about his quarantine and his situation. Um, however, he ultimately recovered and resumed his normal job as an ER doc in Manhattan. As seen there. Um, later that year, Time Magazine would call people like him the Ebola fighters, the Time Magazine person of the year of 2014. So what is Ebola? Um, you know, I've talked to you about like what was in the news and kind of on a global scale, but when you get right down to the molecular level, what is it? So it's a very deadly virus with a mortality rate above 70%. If you remember from Jason talking about smallpox, that has about a 30% mortality rate. So Ebola is that much more infectious and that much more deadly. Um, Ebola is spread by direct contact with an infection, infectious person's blood, um, and symptoms include severe bleeding from the eyes and the ears, vomiting, and diarrhea. It's like not a good time. Uh, so where does Ebola come from? Uh, so Ebola is found deep in the jungle, most likely lying dormant in fruit bats. Uh, as the human population grows and people expand into these wilderness areas, uh, they encounter animals that naturally harbor the virus. Um, killing these animals and preparing them for food exposes the hunters to the blood uh, and any viruses that might be there. And uh, finally, uh, after one person is, is infected, they can then transmit it um, among their family and friends and wider community um, through direct contact with infected blood. Um, so the 2013 crisis is behind us. Um, but this wasn't the first time that humanity has seen Ebola. Um, people, uh, researchers in the field think that Ebola, uh, they pinpointed its first jump from animals into humans in the early part of the 20th century. Um, so uh, we have suffered out outbreaks of this deadly virus before. In 1976, um, the first widespread Ebola outbreak occurred um, in Zaire, which is now the uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, months later, a couple uh, hundred miles uh, away in South Sudan, there was a separate outbreak. Um, and then in 1979, in the same village in Sudan, um, the virus reemerged. Fast forward 10 years, those outbreaks in Africa fade to memory. And that brings us a little closer to home. So, um, pictured here is an actual 
uh, picture, uh, a microscope picture um, of a closely related virus to Ebola called the Restin virus. Um, Restin would begin as a mystery and end as a terrifying scare in one of our country's most populated areas. Um, it all began in 1989 when a group of research monkeys um, mysteriously fell ill. So one monkey died, which sometimes happens. Then a second one, a couple days later, also was found dead. And by the end of the week, up to a dozen monkeys were found dead in this research facility. So something was obviously going on. And so a government researcher was doing routine follow-up and took some of the tissue in the cells and looked at it under a microscope. And this picture is what he saw. Um, it turns out that the monkeys were imported from the Philippines, where there might have been a locally um, circulating uh, outbreak of Ebola. Um, uh, of this Ebola-like virus, um, and then it was shipped across the globe and ended up right outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, it turns out that no humans were ultimately infected in this uh, whole fiasco, um, but it really resonated with people, and it would become the, uh, the inspiration for the um, 1995 New York Times bestseller book, The Hot Zone, which is a nonfiction retelling of this account, um, and you can see it here on our handout. Um, and so what changed? You know, the, the, the series of outbreaks in the 70s and 80s were bad, but the 2013 <laughs> Ebola outbreak was unprecedented. So what changed in the intervening about half a uh, century? So in the 1970s, the virus was mo mostly contained to rural areas where it had limited areas uh, to spread. Uh, it had recently emerged from animals just a couple decades before in the early 1920s, so it hadn't really had time to adapt to humans, and there were many fewer international airports in Africa, so if there was you know, a local outbreak, it didn't really have that much opportunity to spread. Fast forward about 50 years, and um, the 2013 outbreak occurred mostly um, in urban, set, uh, urban centers, like capital cities in these African countries, which let it go from a small outbreak to a full-blown epidemic. Um, it had mutated to become more deadly and better adapted to infecting people. Um, and again, with the tens of thousands of uh, flights every day, it was much easier to, for uh, Ebola to spread into neighboring countries. Um, and so while this 2013 Ebola crisis is over, um, a smaller outbreak circulated earlier this year in the DRC um, from May through July of this year. And then that uh, was concluded in July 2018. There's a swift response, they took care of it. And then a month later, across the country, there was yet another outbreak. That one is still ongoing. Um, there's been 151 cases, uh, over 100 deaths. Um, and scientists are monitoring it to see if this outbreak progresses to a full-blown epidemic. Um, as we move forward, scientists and medical professionals um, you know, are working on the situation, they're monitoring it, um, and coming up with future strategies to better combat viruses like Ebola. So moving on, the next virus I want to tell you about is, uh, is Zika. So this one is a little closer to home. Um, it, you may recall it was a large epidemic in the Americas from 2015 to 2016. Um, in contrast to Ebola, it's not outwardly deadly. You know, people aren't bleeding in emergency rooms and stuff like that. Um, but it can cause a severe birth defect that I'll, I'll speak to you in a minute. Um, and there were confirmed cases across South America, the Caribbean, um, and even in the United States in Puerto Rico and uh, Florida. So what is Zika? Uh, it was first discovered in 1947, the first outbreak 50 years later. Um, symptoms are very general. They include fever, rash, body aches, and actually up to 80% of people infected with the virus will never know they're infected. Uh, it's particularly a threat to expecting mothers because uh, it causes this um, condition called microcephaly. And what that means is that newborn babies will come out with smaller head circumferences, so their heads are smaller, um, and this causes neurological and developmental um, delays that will maybe last the whole um, lifetime. And uh, the last point on this is that there's no treatment available, um, either prevention or therapeutics. So how is Zika transmitted? It's a little different from Ebola, as you'll see. So it starts with one infected person. Then 
a mosquito comes and bites that infected uh, person and transmits it to an uninfected blue person down here. So the virus goes to the mosquito, the mosquito bites this person, and then he becomes infected. This happens exponentially, and that's how you can get a huge outbreak, um, as we saw in 2015. And so one place where this outbreak occurred was in Rio de Janeiro at the 2016 Olympics. Um, and this is really bad because uh, Brazil has the kind of mosquitoes needed to transmit the disease um, in the manner I showed you. And so during the Olympics, key athletes um, like golfer Jason Day and even tennis superstar Serena Williams um, either skip the Olympics altogether or express serious doubt about coming. Um, so uh, responses used for Zika. So how, how did we combat this, especially with, with Ebola? just um, you know, three years before, um, there was different responses and people knew we had to take it seriously. Um, so these therapeutics included cutting edge technologies and more traditional methods. So the New York Times covered scientists' efforts to genetically engineer mosquitoes in order to combat this outbreak. Um, engineer mosquitoes, so what does that mean? Does it mean something like this? No, it's a little more boring. Basically, they just made mosquitoes um, that, that would lead to sterile offspring. So, um, so basically, you crash the mosquito population, and if there's less mosquitoes, there's less Zika virus. Also, there was um, less tech savvy ways of going about it, like the good old fashioned insect repellent. Um, and that was used in widely populated areas like, um, like the Olympics and also Disney World. Fun fact, I went to Disney World during that time and I got so much bug spray and mosquito repellent. It was great. This is a good souvenir. Um, so compared to the 2013 Ebola crisis, uh, the international response was much swifter and they took it really much more seriously um, than Ebola, which is one of the reasons why it came and went so quickly. Um, and so people now realize that uh, investments in healthcare infrastructure and train and develop teams and coordinating internationally and locally um, can really help fight these diseases. Um, and another effort, another reason why Zika, you know, came and went so quickly, um, apart from the governmental societal impacts, was um, improvements in diagnostics. And so, um, as Jason touched on, um, the genome is a part of the virus that transmits the information, um, like DNA. And so one way you can track viruses and kind of survey them and see how they, they move throughout a population is with DNA sequencing. So in 2013, this is what it looked like. It's about the size of an oven, mostly confined to academic laboratories, state labs, things like that. You move forward three years to the peak of the Zika uh, outbreak, and it looks something like this, it was this guy. Um, not the man up there, that's an astronaut who also used the sequencer in space. Um, in the small circle is uh, the Oxford Nanopore, and it's about a little bigger than a USB drive. Um, and this means that it's cheaper, easier to take in the field, and you can actually use it in clinical applications. So you can test in real time in about an hour to see if someone is infected with Ebola, Zika, or the viruses of tomorrow. Um, and lastly, what's going on with Zika today? Um, so, you know, as I alluded to, it came and went so quickly. Um, at the peak of the crisis, you're seeing um, 35,000 cases of Zika a week. Um, a year and a half later, it crashed down to you know, just a couple hundred cases. And this year, there's only been two reported cases of um, transmission here in the United States. Um, so researchers today, are doing a lot of research on the virus, trying to understand what makes it tick, and more importantly, why did it um, stop at the outbreaks or at the epidemic stage and not really, you know, go across the world or kill as many people as um, Ebola did. Um, and so, uh, with the threat of Zika mostly behind us, we can appreciate uh, one effective vaccine or va effective uh, outbreak response looks like. You know, what are the technologies that we can use to move forward? And um, as Mokta will talk to you about next, what are scientists working on today to help us prepare for tomorrow? Thank you. Questions? Yeah. Do you have a question? So 
wants to know how Zika started or where it came from. And is it known why it suddenly seemed to have dropped off? Yeah, that's a good question. So the question is, where did Zika come from? Um, and why did it drop off so quickly? Um, so Zika is thought to circulate in mosquitoes in mostly tropical areas. Um, and the best reason they think of why it crashed off so quickly is uh, it peaked right about winter time or in April, which is winter time in the southern hemisphere. And so that ended up killing a lot of the mosquitoes. Um, and so if you kill the mosquitoes, you can't transmit the disease. Um, and also these prevention methods like closing down airports and you know real-time monitoring um, lets you have a better case on what's going on. But a kind of larger takeaway is we don't really know, and so that's why we're still studying it. Yes? Uh, if a man is infected with Zika and he's like, trying to get uh, pregnant with a woman, then could the baby get microcephaly even if like, the woman doesn't initially have Zika? Yeah, that's a good question. So it's um, if a uh, if a couple is trying to get pregnant and the man contracts Zika, does that prevent, uh, present the risk of microcephaly to their kid? And the answer is yes. So uh, most of Zika transmission is through mosquitoes, but it can also happen through direct contact. And if an infected man has it, then they can actually carry it for six months and go on to infect their baby. All right. Any more questions? Okay, I'll take one more. If you have any more, you can talk to me at intermission. Um, yes? Uh, just a, you are talking about current or contemporaneous uh, viruses, right? Like uh, Ebola and Zika. Right. So we, if the Ebola is like a 70% mm -hmm. deadly rate, which one is the current uh, virus that <coughs> is at our time that is most deadly in, in right now? Right. So the question was, Ebola had a super high death rate, you know, 70%. Are there any viruses that have a higher death rate at this moment? Um, and the answer is yes. Rabies virus actually has close to 100% death rate if you become infected. Um, the good news for that is that there's a treatment, so you get a series of vaccines within the first month, um, and it's really highly effective. Um, but if you don't get the rabies vaccine after you're bitten by a rabid dog or something like that, um, you'll almost certainly die. Thank you guys. And now we're going to have our intermission. And so that'll be about a five to 10 minute break. And then Mokta will take up. And yes, if you want to sign up for our demo afterward, which is a cool little demonstration we're doing about, about viruses, um, you can sign up at the table here. So let's get back to our exciting topic of viral pandemics. Here's the about past viral epidemics including the deadly Zika smallpox and HIV. And Austin talked to you guys about present day epidemics like Ebola and Zika. And now I'm going to talk to you guys about the future of viral epidemics. So, if a deadly virus that can easily spread amongst people in a smart is the world ready to handle the epidemics that it may cause? If it spread, if it, if it spread and infected different regions all over the world, are we ready to handle a full blown pandemic? Remember what Austin told us, this could easily happen. Our population has doubled within the last 50 years, and we'll live down as we go to six. Also, over 300,000 trips are made by air each day. So it would take long for a highly transmissible virus that get all the flow and fast. So this makes you wonder, is there any way we could uh, predict how and where the next viral epidemic uh, occur? It does occur. How do we respond? Are we prepared? Uh, are we ready uh, to be able to treat people that are quickly falling to the illness and also protect those who haven't been affected yet? So Bill Gates has already stressed the impact of the next epidemic. Remember, he said if anything kills over 10 million people within the next few decades, it most likely going to be a highly infectious virus. So we don't expect this kind of threat the problem is, you have no idea what it's going to be. So what should we even call it? The World Health Organization thinks you should call it ZX. So ZX is basically the code name given to the currently unknown infectious threat that's going to cause the next serious viral uh, international epidemic. On May 7th of this year, 
The World Health Organization added disease X to the blueprint priority disease list. So this list basically contains diseases that have potential to uh, cause great public health crises but have no treatments or vaccines. And these actions added to this to increase awareness and boost research efforts. And because people have acknowledged this, we now see highlights like this are the evidence. This news, news clipping from a few months ago is talking about whether upper flu in China could be disease tests. This strain actually uh, emerged and killed 38% of the 1,625 people that it affected. So, how do we prepare for disease tests? First, we try to predict where and how this disease could emerge. And second, we need to organize different strategies to respond to the disease epidemic. So how are viral epidemic uh, predictions being made? Epidemics are predicted primarily by studying viruses that are carried by animals because they are the primary source for new human viruses. Thus far, a total of 586 animals virus associations have been made. And among all animals, bats, primates, and rodents carry the high proportion of viruses. And out of these three species, bats rank the first in the number of viruses they carry. So a key factor in predicting is assessing the animal to human transmissions. For example, if you recall, uh, Ebola came from contact with the infected um, the virus like bats that infected primates and other animals that eventually transmitted it to people. So there are different factors uh, that contribute to the greater chance, the greater chance of animal to human transmission. The first one is job. Geography can be used to predict a uh, viral epidemic by looking at where animals significant amount of viruses are located. So in these maps, you can see regions with the greatest potential for future uh, viral outbreaks. The darker here, the more concentrated the animals are in that area. So you can see here that some of the critical areas of the northern part, northern region of uh, South America, where we find the highest concentration of bats, and the central East, uh, region, eastern region of Africa, where we find the greatest number of uh, primates. Another factor that influences transmission is actually climate change. Climate change factors in because as the plant, as the climate gets warm temperatures, expand the range of virus carrying animals that prefer the tropical climate. To this day, the has escaped outbreaks like Zika, dengue, and yellow fever. And this is mainly because Aedes aegypti, the mosquito that actually spreads these viruses, prefers to the tropical climate. This mosquito is actually restricted to the Gulf Coast region of southern Florida in the US. But with climate change, now it's been identified as far north as Washington, DC. Now, before I leave this slide, I would highly recommend you all to come to another Science in the News lecture or seminar on hunters. So, we talked about different ways to predict uh, viral epidemics, but predicting the next epidemic with certainty is actually very challenging. And this is due to these two reasons. One is it's difficult to predict what could happen in nature at any point in time. There are many unpredictable ways new and many viruses. Also, second is, is un, uh, second is the unpredictable nature of human behavior. People can come across a different barrier that people are exposed to. An excellent example of the unpredictability of nature is actually the emergence of new and dangerous parts of the known as antigenetic shift. So, antigenetic shift is a process by which two or more uh, viruses. That virus strains can combine to form new particles with mixed particles. Here in this image, you can see a highly pathogen uh, avian or bird food virus that just certainly converts, then it comes in contact with a human strain virus, and those two viruses can combine to form what is now a new highly pathogenic spread amongst people. The most recent uh, 2009 H1N1 pandemic 
and demonstrate was actually the result of anti-deficient. Alright, so and now that we've seen different ways uh, the next viral epidemic could occur, let's show you talk about the difference that the epidemics. We'll cover three strategies. The first one is improving real-time monitoring of emerging diseases. Second is building public health structure. And third is developing novel or new vaccine technologies. So let's start with the first step. Um, so there are global, they're, they're both global countrywide efforts put forth in monitoring uh, emerging diseases that could cause epidemics. Globally, the World Health Organization or the WHO keep tabs on the number of disease cases and deaths for countries around the world. There are also regulations in place that require each country to report to the WHO when disease when epidemic prone diseases emerge. Within the U.S., the CDC similarly tracks disease cases and deaths and monitors personal health behavior of people by using different surveillance systems. The biggest issue with the overall global disease surveillance system right now is lack of technology in third world countries. This issue can easily be resolved by uh, upgrading uh, telecommunications in remote areas introducing uh, electronic laboratories. Now, the second strategy, improving public health infrastructure, is a big issue. And here, by public health infrastructure, what we're talking about is the hospitals, the laboratories, as well as the, health, the trained healthcare professional that are responsible by health care to people. So the public health infrastructure in most countries is actually lacking in the need funding and support. Until an epidemic occurs, most governments don't realize how important it is to invest in their health care. And once the epidemic occurs, this is actually uh, a lot more uh, a lot more financially. For example, NICA could end up costing uh, Latin America and the Caribbean about $8 million. And the Ebola outbreak in uh, West Africa actually cost $5 billion to control. And countries affected by the virus actually lost around $2 billion in GDP or uh, economic growth. So the government should, the most government should increase the money of health care so that they are prepared for an epidemic threat. Now let's move on to the last strategy. The level of technology is epidemics. Here I'm going to remind everyone of what they should pull this at the beginning of this talk, which is that vaccines have done an incredible job at protecting us from any diseases that we used to die from in the past. It's not just measles, it's not just me measles uh, virus that vaccines have helped control as long as it's described. That, uh, they also help control viruses such as uh, polio, HPV, and hepatitis. According to the CDC, vaccines have actually helped prevent 20 million deaths worldwide. And so vaccines are the most effective tool we can use in combating epidemics. But the only issue of vaccines though is that they take a long time to develop and produce. As you can see in this table, they can actually take over 20 years. So this brings the question, if the next epidemic were to hit tomorrow, how long would researchers need to develop a vaccine for it? And how long would it produce an antidote for everyone? An effective vaccine would need to be one that we could produce quickly and one that could be made available for the public fast. And here's where the recently developed synthetic vaccines come. Synthetic vaccines are very quick to make. These vaccines are basically vaccines synthesized of made or made of genetic materials we talked about earlier, DNA and RNA. So how are synthetic vaccines faster made than other vaccines? So to understand this, we really need to learn how understand how that vaccines work. So most old, old vaccines are basically dead or weakened viruses. So when we did, so when we did a virus vaccine, it's definitely to the body. The body thinks that the weak virus is a threat and builds up analogs. So, antibodies are basically the ninja system. 
So next time a lie works, actually affects the body, the body is ready to fight it. So maybe the maybe virus and the vaccine actually is important. But here's an idea. What if we can just infect the body with the instructions to make the part of the virus by using DNA or RNA? Making RNA and DNA molecules is very simple and it's a very quick process. And that's why the study that we have the part to make. So with that, we'll kind of end our talk here with one last message to give you guys. And it is to take your vaccines. <laughs> Even if the most sophisticated vaccines are produced, it doesn't matter if the majority of us uh, don't take them. If only some of us are vaccinated, viruses get a chance to stop us. Take this will um, use a graphic sound on this website from the Guardian. Um, before I open it up, the let me use the so the blue dots here are the vaccinated people, the yellow are not vaccinated, and the red is the disease or the foods. So also pay attention to the different communities with different vaccination rates. You can see in Oklahoma County of Washington, they have uh, around 50% the vaccination rate. And in Gadsden County in Florida, they have a very positive 99.10% uh, vaccination rate. So let's go over to the website. It's pretty cool. All right, goes pretty fast, so you don't have to keep up with it. You see how the virus kind of easily infiltrates these communities that have low vaccination rates? See how everybody's getting sick because majority of the people aren't infected. See, that's like 68 percent there, and the virus are able to infiltrate. But see, the more vaccinated communities are more resistant to viruses coming in and infecting. See, Orange and California is doing pretty good, even though there are a few people that haven't been vaccinated. Those who are vaccinated are protecting the people that haven't been vaccinated in our society. Example that shows you how you know the more people are vaccinated, the more effective vaccines are in those communities. 